All right, we've reached uh, Grant's tomb. We'll go around front. Look at the front of this thing. That's a behemoth uh, monument, isn't it? It's on a huge track of uh, real estate here between Riverside Drive and the Hudson. Up in Manhattan around 121st Street. You have nine out of ten New Yorkers. Even some who are like a few blocks from here. Where's Grant's tomb? And they'll look at you like you're not have no idea. Well, Grant's friends, you know, these friends, uh, they, they, they subscribed, they, you know, contributed. And he obviously had a lot of Republican friends. Certainly didn't have many Democrats. This is a Democrat town. Uh, they landscaped the entire thing. It's a huge piece of property. And all these trees were planted after. The photographs of this thing just sitting bare all by itself on this plane here, edge of this cliff. Uh, his wife Julia is buried with him in there. And you can compare this to uh, the effort that the friends of uh, George made in his uh, burial. Uh, a bliss. Uh, what can we say about this? This, this, is, uh, this isn't a government event that did this. I don't know how it's being maintained. I assume that there was a fund of some sort. I think the National Park Service now has some control over it. thing. Look at this. Uh, you know, they don't, this, this competes with Lincoln's uh, monument in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, while uh, it really does compete with it, I don't think there's another monument in the United States that is uh, so huge in scale and uh, to represent a tomb. Uh, now, Grant was a poor man when he died. He was basically broke. The story is that Mark Twain wrote his biography. Uh, he gets, uh, Grant gets credit for being a great writer. Grant couldn't even spell. All you gotta do is read his letters to his wife during the Civil War. The guy had no, he graduated West Point, he had no idea how to spell. Uh, it's pretty pathetic. But, uh, he had that one quality that makes a great soldier, and that is the ability to ignore the fact that uh, thousands and thousands of young men are gonna die at your uh, beck and call. I mean, Napoleon had that skill, Eisenhower had that skill, General Lee had that skill. I mean, this is a select group of military officers. There's just no room in war for concern over the lives of your men. You know, Longstreet had this problem. Longstreet could, uh, could accept casualties, but uh, you had to sort of drag him to it. Uh, once he got to it, uh, he, you know, he performed just as well as the four men I mentioned. Now, uh, you know, it's expensive to maintain this place, as you can see, like, these other monuments I've been showing you, the age is telling. It's just, uh, you know, the Civil War is 150 years ago, and, and uh, look at this uh, slate pavement that originally was put here in about, uh, I think it was about, well, I don't know when, when Grant died, but, it, you know, it was at that time, not too, not too late. I don't know how many years passed between his death and the construction of this place, but uh, it's, it's taken its toll. Just a huge piece of property. I would say the property, the square foot, the footprint, is uh, about the same size as uh, 
Lincoln Memorial in Washington. A killer. He was a killer. They complained early in the war about General Lee. You know, uh, later in the war, they complained that he had, he had burned so many casualties in the beginning of the war. You know, they lamented uh, 30,000, 40,000 casualties that the Confederacy incurred from Beaver Dam Creek, Gaines Mill, Cedar Mountain. Malvern Hill, Cedar Mountain, Second Manassas, and TM. Uh, well, not on TM. Let's scratch it on TM. But those first, uh, those first five battles, including Sidney Johnson's battle in Tennessee, which brought him about 15,000 uh, uh, casualties. So you had about, you had about 50,000, 60,000 casualties when you count them all up. And they were all incurred by General Lee and Sidney Johnson in attacking, attacking on the offensive, trying to push these people out, back where they belong, get them out of the country. You can't win a war standing on the defensive. And the silliness to think that you can. So you had to attack, and Sidney Johnson and General Lee had no qualms about attacking. Because in, in their minds, they understand that principle. And General Grant understood it too. Uh, he's just, a, in that sense, an amazing fellow. You can consider it the history of the man when he left the United States Army and he was working in his uh, family's uh, leather goods store in Goleta, Illinois, and the war came along. It was a godsend to him. And he used initiative. He immediately seized the opportunity. He, he had friends. John Pope took care of him, introduced him to uh, John Friedman. Friedman put him in a slot uh, that he was in by the time Henry Halleck appeared on the scene. And Halleck tried to maneuver to get him out of that slot, get somebody else that he liked in there, but fate was against Halleck, and, and uh, Grant got to Donaldson, and that won him that major generalship, and, and he was off and running. Uh, he was not... Uh, not a brilliant uh, general. He was, had nothing to do with the idea of uh, maneuver, tactics, mounting offensives. If anything, the, the, the generals underneath him did all that kind of work. The standout would be George Thomas, uh, who's recognized with a, with a nice uh, monument. He has his own circle in Washington, D.C. Well, the Army of Tennessee is certainly represented in Washington, D.C. We've got Grant, Sherman, now I found George Thomas. And George has got a large circle of real estate here, as you can see, in front of the National City Christian Church, some other old church. Look at that. So much for George. What hell on that is. Massive piece. George Thomas. The general that actually fought the battles for Grant. William Sherman. George Thomas. Those guys did the work. Uh, Grant had the rank and uh, he just pushed. Pushed, pushed, pushed. Ignore the casualties. Strike the blows. Gain more territory. Until uh, the, the war was won in the West, hands down, within six months of 1862. And, uh, but for General Lee, there's just hardly any doubt that Virginia would have fallen, to, Richmond would have fallen to McCullen in 18. But, as I said before, McCollum had a soft heart. Let's look at the scale of this thing. The 
wide plaza. This has nothing to do with the fact this man had been president of the United States. Great eagles that are here, but up here, you know, this, this is sort of, you know, incongruous by pronouncing the word properly. You youngsters, make sure you correct me. What does this say? Let us have peace. Let's see if we can go inside. Look at his uh, red granite monolith that sits over his remains and that of his wife Julian. I'm not going to go inside. The reason is that you used to be able to walk in those doors. That's how the thing was designed. But our federal government is so nervous. They're so frightened of the, you know, the, the, the fellows with the long beards and the turbans. <laughs> you can't walk in this place anymore until you go through security. And you can't go through there. you got to go in the basement. And it's, you know, it's ridiculous. Uh, if you walk through these doors, you'd find a uh, a rotunda, much like uh, Napoleon's tomb in the uh, Invalids in uh, Paris. Essentially the same design. Now let's see if, uh, if I'm correct. If they open the door, we'll go in. <laughs> like they're going to read those signs on the door, I think. Okay. I get to go nowhere. Can't can't go anywhere here anymore. <laughs> Just pathetic. Just pathetic. We've come to this. As this new generation is living with this security. It's just pathetic. You go to Washington DC, it's an armed fort. Oh, they're so frightened. God. Yeah, bad things happen. That's always been the case. Nothing new about it now. So when you come to New York, you can go around to the basement. 